Congressional Republicans and Democrats continued to battle throughout yesterday over a bill to prop up the American economy during the crisis. Republicans are asking for funds to support corporations so they can survive the lockdown. Democrats are asking for a gigantic field of windmills to be planted over the entire landmass of any state that voted for President Trump with windmill blades that are dusted with biodegradable sparkles and will hurl a rainbow of thrilling colors through the air as they produce enough energy to power a cell phone for three minutes every time there's a tornado. Republicans are requesting a series of payouts to workers to tide them over the downtime until business starts up again. Democrats are requesting the cows be required to use their hooves to tap out in Morse code the amount of greenhouse gases they're discharging, while at the same time airlines will be required to print the number of calories in every non-vegan meal served in any state they fly over, with each menu vetted by the legal firm of Pelosi, Pelosi, and Pelosi. No relation. Republicans are asking that the bill contain funding for small businesses so they can continue payroll payments. Democrats demand that the bill include funding for the Transgender Children's Chorus to entertain every union meeting in America with a rousing chorus of Be Our Guest, and that the unions afterward distribute awards for bravery to any nine-year-old boy willing to do a sexy dance in a pink can-can dress and a guarantee from employers to pay for the boy's funeral after he grows up and commits suicide. The arguments grew heated as the two sides deadlocked with Mitch McConnell raising his voice to an inaudible murmur, Nancy Pelosi flying over the Capitol building spelling out the words, surrender Dorothy, and Mitt Romney throwing an apron over his face and running around in circles screaming, I don't know what on earth to do, in a quavering falsetto. More news as it develops. Trigger warning, I'm Andrew Clavin, and this is The Andrew Clavin Show. I'm the hunky donkey. Life is tickety boo. Birds are winging, also singing, hunky dunkety doo. Ship shape, tipsy topsy, the world is a bitty zing. It's a wonderful day, hurrah, hooray! It makes me want to sing. Oh, hurrah, hooray! Oh, hooray, hurrah! So, this may seem a bit off topic, but it's actually not. I'm a strong opponent of the universal basic income. It's always been a bad idea, and it still is, even if Andrew Yang is the nicest guy in politics. When the idea was floated by Milton Friedman back in the 80s, it was as part of a fantasy he was having in which every other welfare program was shut down, and all those payments were funneled into this one UBI. Since that will never happen, UBI is just another entitlement that will grow and grow and ultimately bankrupt us if we're not already bankrupt from all the other entitlements. But worse than that, the UBI assumes that work is going to dry up for ordinary people because of automation and robotics. The idea is that the working man and woman are about to become inessential and obsolete, especially in highly developed countries like ours. They should be glad to get a payout instead of the employment that gives dignity and meaning to their lives. I guess it will help them buy the Oxycontin they can take to deaden the pain of having become functionally useless. So UBI solves the problem of the obsolete working person. Let me ask you this. As you watch this current crisis unfold, does the working person seem obsolete to you? Does the grocer, the truck driver, the mail deliverer, the farmer, the delivery guy from Amazon, do they seem obsolete right now? Amazon is hiring. Do you think they're hiring executives? Do you think they're hiring HR diversity managers? Or are they hiring more guys like the kid who dropped off some food at my place yesterday and waved at me through the window to make sure I was still alive because he seems pretty essential? George Soros, Stephen Colbert, every dean of diversity in the country could vanish in a great big puff of smoke, and I don't think any of us would notice one little bit. And what about the moms? You think they're essential right now? Homeschooling, keeping the kids sane, doing what moms have done since time began, as opposed to some glamour girl from Hollywood whose value about this time has dropped to somewhere between zero and, that's it, zero. Me, as you know, I think the moms were always essential, but no one wants to say so because the screeching feminists screech them down. But now we see it. I think this crisis has revealed that universal basic income is a solution to a problem we're not going to have the problem of the obsolete working person. That's not going to happen except in the imaginations of deep thinkers in their Silicon Valley compounds. Another problem, the problem of the obsolete celebrity, the problem of the obsolete political activist, the obsolete bureaucrat, the obsolete Silicon Valley deep thinker, that's a problem that could reach crisis proportions anytime within the next 24 hours or 24 minutes. 
All right. We're going to talk more about the things we're seeing during this crisis, but let us talk about LifeLock. What do you think? What do you think hackers are doing right now? What do you think? They're, they're hanging around at home. They're bored. They're not making money going out and picking pockets or whatever they do in their spare time. They're looking for a way to get into your stuff online and steal it. And that is why it is a great time to get LifeLock. It's also tax season. So you're probably sending a bunch of stuff over email, like your name, social security, lots of valuable information about your that you don't usually send and criminals can get into that and they can get into your devices and sell all that stuff on the dark web or use it to commit identity theft. And once they do that, your life is a mess. That is why LifeLock will get out there and help you not just prevent identity theft if they can, but if your th identity gets stolen, they will help you put things back together. No one can prevent all identity theft or monitor all transactions on all businesses, but having LifeLock means one less thing to stress about. Join now and save up to 25% off your first year. Just go to LifeLock.com slash Clavin. That's LifeLock.com slash Clavin for 25% off. Don't let anybody steal the secret of how to spell Clavin. I don't know, maybe, maybe it's not a secret. I'm not, I'm not sure. We may put it out there a lot. You want to subscribe to Daily Wire because you want to be in the mailbag tomorrow. Tomorrow is the mailbag. If you subscribe, you can ask me any question you want. Just go to dailywire. Yeah! That, that is how happy you will be when you get my answers and they solve all the problems of your life. Go to dailywire.com, hit the podcast button, hit the Andrew Clavin podcast. There's a little mailbag symbol. Send in your questions about politics, about religion, about your personal life. My answers are guaranteed 100% correct and will change your life. Will they change it for the better? <laughs> it's kind of a stupid question. All right. <laughs> so, you know, the theme of my program today is we see you. This should be a hashtag. I'm never smart enough to make hashtags on Twitter, but it should be a hashtag. We see you. We see what you're doing. You know, they say they're getting close to a deal on this relief package, but I don't care. I want to remember this moment. I want to remember what is being done. The House uh, Democrats have been trying to squeeze garbage into this relief bill, this much needed uh Belief, relief bill. And uh, what was happening was they were negotiating it in, in different, you know, groups, different task forces. They were getting for, they were going forward. They were moving forward. Chuck Schumer, this is Chuck Schumer on Saturday talking about it. You think it'll be wrapped up by Monday? Well, I hope it is. We're having good bipartisan agreements. Actually, to my delight and surprise, there has been a great deal of bipartisan cooperation thus far. Yeah, even the president was speaking uh, very uh, positively about you. And, uh, yeah, that, e even that doesn't Speaker, happen very often. <laughs> even Speaker Pelosi as well. Yeah. Uh, and you're speaking positively about them as well. You're a lying so dog-faced pony soldier. <laughs> now they, they had this going. They had it. And then Nancy Pelosi swanned in with all this stuff. There was a, uh, last week, there was a conference call featuring more than 200 members of the House Democratic Caucus and reportedly Majority Whip James Clyburn, who we remember from saving... Joe Biden's career, he said, this is a tremendous opportunity to restructure things to fit our vision. This is a tremendous opportunity to restructure things to fit our vision. And Ted Cruz really blasted them. This is what he said. This is five, cut five. Listen to the men and women in your states. Don't give in to the games. You know, most of the Democratic senators say they don't even know what their side wants. That it's just their leadership that's willing to hold the American people hostage for unrelated political partisan objectives. And by the way, one of the reasons I think Senate Democrats are so willing to engage in this is they expect the media to be utterly complicit. That's absolutely right. They're old. They're old. And they're used to three networks. They're used to being able to hide there and be invisible in the media. That Those days are over. We see you. We see each and every one of you. And we're going to make sure you know it come November. 
All right, let's take a closer look at what they're doing. Let's take a look at what the New York Times did, right? This is really true. Nancy Pelosi swans in with these things. I'm going to tell you some of the stuff she was asking for because it's amazing. It is amazing. This is a bill to provide relief to businesses, corporations, and workers so they can get through this crisis, which is very difficult for everybody, right? This is a tough time. This is a genuinely, this is a genuine emergency, right? And it's typical when you're negotiating for a bill that the other side wants very badly, it's typical to stuff in a lot of pork, right? That's what pork is. It's where you stuff, you stuff this stuff in and you get it going. That is typical. This is not a typical time. It's typical to, for me to walk out of the door and go to work in the morning. I'm not doing that because it's not a typical time. You can't just say, oh, I walk out of the work. I walk out to work every day. And somebody says, yeah, but your house is on fire and your kids are inside. They're acting typically in the midst of a crisis. So they came in, they botched this up. They held the, the Congress hostage. They held this bill hostage. And here is the New York Times reporting on it, right? Their first story says Democrats block action on 1.8 trillion stimulus. That was a few minutes after this happened. Then somebody called up the, the, the editor and said, wait, that's true. Take that out of my New York Times. That's true that we were a former newspaper. We're not still a newspaper. Don't do that. So they changed it. Democrats block action on stimulus plan seeking worker protections. They had a good reason to do what they were doing. It, another phone call to the editor. Well, no, 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 that's still, that's still too close to true. So they changed it again. Part, all the same day, this is all the same day, partisan divide threatens deal on rescue bill. Now, you can always tell in the New York Times when something happens by an entity that's not human, that has no free will, you can always tell it's the Democrats' fault. It's uh, just an absolute giveaway. Partisan divide threatens deal on rescue bill. That partisan divide, you know, I hate that guy, partisan divide. Mr. Divide, you, it's time for you to... It was Nancy Pelosi. It was the Democrats. They did it. Finally, today, <laughs> they have an editorial that says... that what What is it? Let me just get the... The coronavirus bailout stalled, and it's Mitch McConnell's fault. The failing New York Times, which is like so bad. <laughs> the failing New York Times. The lying New York Times. How do they how do they look in the mirror in the morning? Really? The, Senator Mitch McConnell of Kentucky reading this failed to do his job this weekend. <laughs> what was he supposed to do? Lay, lay out tax so that her Nancy Pelosi's limousine would c collapse? I mean, listen, Nancy Pelosi went to a lot of trouble. She stepped over all the homeless in her district. She got through all the turds that are lying on their sidewalk because she's let her district fall apart. She's you know, it's hard to get crazed <laughs> lunatic. <laughs> it's hard to get to Washington. It's hard to get to Washington when your place is littered with trash and homeless tents because you can't take care of your district. But she got there. She got there, damn it. And Senator Mitch McConnell of Kentucky failed to do his job as the economy spiraled downward, says the New York Times. Mr. McConnell, the Senate Majority Leader, said he would produce a bipartisan bailout bill authorizing an infusion of desperately needed aid. Instead, Mr. McConnell emerged on Sunday evening with a bill that would provide a lot of help for corporate executives people who hire workers. So let's hear some of the wonderful proposals that Nan let's let's hear from Tom Cotton. He went off on these guys and really delivered just just listing the things they're asking for while they while the Republicans and by the way the Democrats just cleared out. They wouldn't even debate while the Democrats are asking for all this trash while Republicans are trying to save the economy. Here's Tom Cotton. Let's just go through what is a priority for Nancy Pelosi and the Democrats as they dither while Americans die. Corporate board, board diversity. The Democrats want to impose quotas for race and sex on corporate boards. I know they want to do that for a long time. Is that going to stop anyone from getting sick from the coronavirus? There's another one, bailing out the Postal Service, wiping out all the debts that the Post Office has towards the Treasury. It's another issue we've been debating for a long time. Postal Service needs relief. And I greatly respect and praise the hard work of the men and women who are still delivering the mail. But is a survival package for the coronavirus the right time to be talking about Postal Service debt to the Treasury? They're trying to make sure People are lying in hospitals, gasping for breath. People are watching their businesses fold. People are losing their paychecks. They're trying to make sure that there's enough diversity by force of government in corporate boardrooms. That's what they're doing. That's, what, that's how Mitch McConnell failed by not voting for that. that. That's the problem. That's the problem that the New York Times sees. It's all Mitch McConnell's fault. Play, play the other cotton cut. 
early voting mandated in every single state. The same kind of early voting that almost doomed the Democrats' favored presidential candidate, Joe Biden, against whom Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer, or for whom Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer worked tirelessly to beat their colleague, Bernie Sanders. Oh, combine that with same-day registration. Every single state has to register voters on same day. So now they want to pile election rules on a bill that's designed to stop a pandemic? Remind you, election rules written by the same partisan geniuses who couldn't even count their own votes in the Iowa Democratic caucuses. <laughs> so Ted Cruz got up and blasted them. It was like a cruise missile. He just blasted them, really delivered a statesmanlike speech. But my, I got to admit, I'm, I love Ted Cruz. Ted Cruz is like my political spirit animal. But John Kennedy from Louisiana, he had the most quotable response. What the American people are thinking right now, they're thinking that the brain is an amazing organ it starts working in a mother's womb and it doesn't stop working until you get elected to Congress. You know what the American people are thinking right now, Mr. President? They're thinking that this country was founded by geniuses, but it's being run by a bunch of idiots. You know what the American people are thinking right now, Mr. President? They're thinking, why do the members of the United States Senate continue to double down on stupid? <laughs> so, you know, and, and that's that is funny. That's funny stuff. His brain starts working in the mother's womb and doesn't stop working until you get to Congress. But seriously, seriously, you know. If, if, if you're sheltered at home, that's a problem. But if you've lost your job, if you've lost your income, that's a bigger problem. If you've lost your health, of course, that's the biggest problem of all. Senator uh, John Barrasso, he's from Wyoming, and he's a doctor, and he is like one of the more mild-mannered, soft-spoken people in Congress. He just delivered this speech, which it goes on and on. I can only play a little bit of it. But really, putting it to the Democrats exactly the way they should, should hear it. We had Nancy Pelosi flying back from California because she sent the House home a week ago. They're not here to defeat the work that we've done in a bipartisan way and to say, oh, you've done nice work. Now look at our list of laundry, laundry list of things that we are demanding. Tax credits for solar panels, wind turbines, a bailout of the Postal Service. I mean, you can go through this list. Portions of the Green New Deal. Mr. President, I'm a doctor. I've been on the phone with doctors around the country, with my colleagues at the Wyoming Medical Center. They are working double time. They're looking to us for help. They need tests. They need masks. They need respirators. They need hope. Hope that there will be a vaccine. Hope that there will be a treatment. Those things are in this bill that the Democrats voted to block last night, and the Democrats voted to block again today. You know, you ask yourself, you ask yourself, and, and sometimes I feel like I could spend my whole day saying, how can people do this stuff when I read about what people do to one another, when I read what lawmakers do, what politicians do, when I read the journalists uh, put on a jacket and tie in the morning or their working clothes and they go to work and lie like the New York Times is lying right now every single day and distorting things every single day. And I ask myself, like, how can you do that? How can you make your life about that? But in you know, because Nancy Pelosi didn't start out like this. She didn't start out to be this kind of person, to be the person she's become. She probably started out thinking she could make a difference in people's lives in government. You know, she, you know, she's a leftist, but still, she probably had, a, had good ideas. But now, there's just no question that Ted Cruz is right, that they are so used to being invisible. It's Lord of the Rings. It's Lord of the Rings. They have that invisibility ring, and it makes you become evil. They know that the media keeps them invisible, and they can do anything they want, and so they will do anything they want. It is Lord of the Rings. The problem is that ring isn't working anymore. We've got the internet, we've got social media, we're all stuck at home, we're watching them, we see you, we see what you're doing, and we will remember. And it isn't, you're not hidden anymore, the ring is gone. 
All right, let us pause for just a second. And, you know, I'm so glad we have this app today, the Abide app, uh, this ad today for the Abide app, because to be honest, I was going to give them a free ad today because I have been using this every single night. And, you know, I don't sleep and I still don't sleep and it has nothing to do with that. But when I sleep, when I sleep after listening to this Abide app, I am sleeping into in absolute unconsciousness. It is doing something that is calming my mind down. I'm not having dreams. I'm not tossing and turning. It is really amazing. It is a, an, a meditation app for Christians. It's helps you to start or end, in my case, end your day in the spirit and peace of Christ. And what I love about it, I'm just, I'm not going to read the copy. I'm just going to tell you my own experience because I really do love this app. And what I love about it is it's encouraging. It's Bible-based, but it's not sappy. It's not telling you everything is perfect. It's telling you how to react in tough times. It's telling you how to still your mind, how to trust in God. It is, it's important stuff to remember. And it's stuff that I like to remember at the end of the day. It brings me back to myself and it has really been helping me get what sleep I get is incredibly peaceful after listening to this app. I can't guarantee you that that's why. I can't guarantee you that that'll happen to you, but I can tell you that's what's happening to me. So get started now with 25% off a premium subscription by downloading the Abide app at abide.co slash Clavin. You'll get additional stories and meditations, premium music, soothing sounds, and more. Support this show and get 25% off by going to abide.co slash Clavin. That's A-B-I-D-E dot C-O slash Clavin to download the Abide app and get 25% off your premium subscription. I mean, <laughs> you know, that is hell abide, but how do you spell Clavin? There are no E's in Clavin. <laughs> there are no E's in Clavin. I just make it look this easy, folks. Anyway, really get the app. It, it, it is terrific. Um, all right. So, of course, now one of the reasons I think they're going to solve this problem in Congress, they're going to get this bill through, is because Trump just came down on them like a ton of bricks. He said, forget it. I'm not signing this. He said, Republicans had a deal. He tweeted this. Republicans had a deal until Nancy Pelosi rode into town from her extended vacation. The Democrats want the virus to win. They're asking for things that have nothing to do with our great workers or companies. They want open borders and Green New Deal. Republicans shouldn't agree. He says he's not going to sign it. I think that kind of uh, put the fear of God into everybody. I think they know now that they've been caught. Uh, you know, and it's just the stuff that they are doing with Trump is part of this as well. They think we can't see them. They think we don't know what's going on. And so they think they can twist everything Trump says. And they do twist everything Trump says. I mean, the other day I played it on the show. He said he was talking about that malaria drug. He had hopes for it. He said if it does turn out to be, he said it might work. This is what he said. It might work and it might not. If it does work, it could be a game changer. So two idiots went out, uh, this man and a woman, I shouldn't call them names because uh, I think one of them died and the other is in critical care. Uh, and they drank a chemical compound f that's used to clean fish aquariums because it had some of this chemical in it. So they thought it was going to cure them. And here's the New York Times story. Man fatally poisons himself while self-medicating for coronavirus, doctor says. An Arizona man and his wife ingested a fish tank cleaning additive made with the same active ingredient as chloroquine phosphate, which President Trump has referred to as a game changer. So not only is it untrue because he didn't say it was a game changer. He said it would be if it works, it might work and it might not. But he didn't tell people to go drink <laughs> aquarium cleaner, you know, I mean, he can't, there's 350 million people in this country. Some of them are not thinking too clearly. It is just absolutely amazing. And the other thing, and, the, and this is the more important thing, as Trump said he would reconsider, and I told you why I thought that that was exactly the right thing. The economy is an issue. It is not putting human life uh, in front, it's not putting money in front of human life. It's understanding that the economy is people. The economy is all is your job. It's the way you take care of your children. It, it is what holds the fabric of society together. It's what keeps people from going uh, going off on each other. It's just really important. So he's talking about that. He said he would reconsider because he didn't want the cure to be worse than the problem. That was what he said. And everybody went insane. Oh, no, we can't reconsider. We can't reassess. That would be terrible. You know, just anything to twist his words. However, I, Joe Biden was on TV. Do we have this clip? He was on TV this morning and he was asked about this. I have to play his response because it's priceless. In Hot Topics, we yes, talked sir. about Trump saying the government would reassess the recommended period for keeping businesses shut and people at home. Are you at all concerned, as Trump said, that we cannot let the cure be worse than the problem itself? We have to take care of the cure. That will make the problem worse no matter what. <laughs> I think, I think Sleepy I, Joe I, Biden, who has no clue what the hell he's doing. 
<laughs> I think what our young friend is saying, he reminds me of Chance from being there. I don't know if you ever read that book or saw that movie about the stupidest man who's been living in a, a room by himself and he wanders around saying dumb things and everybody says, I think what he is saying, and he ultimately becomes president of the United States. That's who he is. He's Chance from being there. He's just a complete, he's now just living in this like floaty dream world. Now, Trump has been honest to the extent that he has said that this is going to get bad. He, he said that the next week, the reason he's talking about 15 days is because they're saying the next week or the next two weeks is when these computer models will either play out or they won't. And they have, they have put their trust in these computer models. Here's cut 12. It's going to be bad. And we have uh, a lot of people dying from the flu, as you know. We have a very bad flu season on top of everything else. It's very bad. It looks like it could be over 50,000. And uh, certainly this is going to be bad. And we're trying to make it uh, so that it's much, much less bad. And that's what we're doing. I think we're doing a very good job of it. So he's he's telling you that he's fighting it. And by the way, the numbers so far, the death rates so far, and all this stuff is in play, but it's not that much worse than South Korea, which is being looked at as a uh, success story. And for reasons I'll talk about in just a second. But he says we can't keep the economy shut down forever. This is cut 15. Not looking at months, I can tell you right now. We're going to be opening up our country and uh, we're going to be watching certain areas and we're going to be practicing everything that... Uh, that Deborah's referring to right here. I mean, we're going to be watching this very closely, but uh, you can't keep it closed for the next, uh, you know, f- for years. Okay, this is going away. We're we're going to win the battle. So this was greeted with the cool, objective, uh, you know, reporting that we expect from MSNBC, uh, from what's his name, Chris, what's his name over at NBC, uh, Chris Hayes. This is cut seven. After about a week of that economic dislocation, as we continue to climb up the exponential curve of cases and of deaths, the president is now listening to voices on the right that say, really, what's a million seniors when you're thinking about the whole economy? That's slightly caricatured, but only slightly. (laughs) Right. So so now they're they're putting out this story. Uh, the New York Times has a story. Trump has given unusual leeway to Fauci, but aides say he's losing his patience. Now, I saw that headline and I knew immediately it was Maggie Haberman because Maggie Haberman, Maggie Haberman, let's remember, uh, Cheryl Atkinson tells this uh, story in her book, uh, Smear. She says, in January 2015, a strategic memo about shaping a public ma- narrative came out from Clinton officials. And they described then political reporter Maggie Haberman as an ideal, friendly journalist willing to generate positive press for the campaign. This is under uh, a file, a title, Placing a Story. This is one of the pilfered emails from the Hillary Clinton campaign. And they said of Maggie Haberman, they said, we have had her tee up stories for us before and have never been disappointed. While we should have a larger conversation in the near future about a broader strategy for reengaging the beat press that covers H.A. RC for this. We think we can achieve our objective and do the most shaping by going to Maggie. It was after that, after that was revealed that the New York Times hired her to cover the White House. So they knew she was a a Clinton hack. They knew what she was and they hired her anyway to do this job. Okay. That's who you're getting. So when she says there's trouble between uh, Trump and Fauci, let's ask Fauci. Let's hear what he said. We present it to the president and he asks a lot of questions. That's his nature. He's constantly asking you questions. And I never, in the multiple times that I've done that, where I said, for scientific reasons, we really should do this, that he hasn't said, let's do it. Or when he's decided, not decided, when he suggests, why don't we do this? And I say, no, that's really not a good idea from a scientific standpoint. He has never overruled me. And he says, and he and Fauci went on to say that he wishes they would stop trying to to create this divide between them. The divide is not there. I mean, it is just, you know, obviously it's shameful. I'm going to get back again to how people can do this stuff. How I mean, I'm, I'm telling you, I could now spend my entire life just walking around going, how can people do this? How can they behave this way? You know, again, I don't think Maggie Haberman started out to be a dishonest person spreading a, a philosophy instead of trying to tell the truth as a reporter. I don't think she started out that way, but I think that that is what she's become. You know, the thing that they're talking about, the thing that they're thinking about is that is kind of what happened in South Korea. In South Korea, they got the tests in place and then they started keeping people who were testing positive indoors, letting other people go to work, keeping old people indoors because 
you know, we're the ones who are at risk, but letting younger people go to work as if they are testing, if they're testing negative. That makes perfect sense. And it's a way to get the economy working again, it, with one exception. You just don't want me to go out ever until everybody else has been out there. It's like the canary in the coal mine. All the rest of you go out there, and if you fall over, keep me safe. This is the important thing. We have to save the Claven. This is because once we lose me, I mean, that's like the linchpin. It's like the, the still center of the turning world. Uh, you want to make sure that I remain safe at all times. Aside from that, all the rest of you, you old people are done for. No, the rest of the old people will shelter in place. They're the people who should be inside. We do not have to do this forever, and I don't think we should do it forever. And we do have to balance the economy against, uh, against the public health thing. Right now, I think we're doing the right thing. Right now, they're trying to keep the hospitals from being overwhelmed. Really important. It's going to be important to see what kind of vaccines and medicines come down the pike. It's going to be important to see what kind of testing comes down the pike. But but uh, reassessing, of course, is a thing you should constantly be doing, and we should know when it's happening. By the way, a morning consult poll uh, shows that perceptions of President Donald Trump's handling of U.S. response to the coronavirus pandemic jumped this week as his administration, Congress, and state and local officials took more dramatic steps to contain the contagion. A morning consult poll conducted Tuesday through Friday found 53% of voters approve of Trump's handling of the spread of the virus compared with 39% who disapprove. And the uptick was largely driven by eight-point bumps in approval from Democrats. So we see you and we're not fooled. All right. All access. You want to hear about this because we'll, I'll be doing one on Thursday and maybe you can amuse yourself with some of the other ones. Uh, in the meantime, uh, if you haven't had a chance to see some of this new content called All Access Live, you should head over to dailywire.com and check it out. Uh, Jeremy, the God King Boring and Ben Shapiro kicked it off last week. And then we all did live streams each day. It's, we continue them. They come on at 8 p.m. Eastern, uh, 5 p.m. Pacific. Like I said, I'll be doing mine on Thursday. So you'll get the gold standard and then you can compare everybody else to them. It's more relaxed than our normal programming. It's less focused on bringing you the news and just about sitting down with you, talking to you, hearing from you. I love hearing from you. I really do. I love getting questions. I'm going to be on at 11 with an Ask Me Anything uh, for uh, All Access members or whoever is allowed. I can't keep track of our <laughs> levels. Whoever is allowed to go on Ask Me Anything can come on and talk to me at 11, too, but I'll also be on on Thursday. The show is intended for our All Access members, but during this national emergency, this time of isolation, we've opened it up to all our members, and in doing so, accelerated the launch. So please let us know what you think of it. If you're around at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific tonight, join us on the All Access Live show over at dailywire.com. Come over to dailywire.com and subscribe because the mailbag is tomorrow. You want to be in there. All your problems will be solved, which is, is pretty good for the cost of a, um, of a subscription. Come on over to dailywire.com. So you ask yourself, how can people do this? I, I mean, I, I really do. I ask myself all the time. And obviously, it's a fallen world. Obviously, we have sinful nature. You see the things that people do to their children. You see the things that people do to others' of children. You see the ideas that they pipe into schools that are confusing and destructive to children's minds and lives. Uh, I, I think right now, I've said this before, but I think that the abuse of children uh, is probably our number one health concern. And I think it's not just the abuse that goes on behind closed doors, horrific as that is, but it's also the abuse of having transvestite story hour of teaching kids about gender when they're seven and don't really know what gender is instead of teaching them about math and letting their children, their parents take care of their uh, values and teach them a value system. I personally think it has a lot to do with people. Uh, there's also abuse by people who have enough money uh, to stay home and make sure their kids have mothers in the house and don't do that because they're just too important. Uh, you know, you can always choose not to have children too. I think there's a, just a lot of stuff that we do where I just ask myself, how can we do the things we do? And there are a lot of different reasons. And a lot of people are sick and a lot of people are twisted and a lot of people have lost their way. But when I watch people like Nancy Pelosi doing what she did, uh, I mean, I, I just sit there and I, I, I try to remind myself that she didn't start out that way. She didn't start out to be that person that she's become, that Clyburn, I'm sure, started out, started out to try and help people, help his constituency. And now he's sitting around thinking, oh, gee, we can use. I mean, if that's a literal, if that's a true quote and it's the sources seem to be good on it, that he was saying we can use this to restructure things the way we want them. What? What is that? What is going on? You know, I mean, the other day, The Atlantic read a, ran a piece called The Virus is Going to be Bad for Feminism. And I'm no fan of feminism. I think it's just a big philosophical mistake insofar as it tells women uh, that they're only 
strength, their only equality is to be men, is to be like men, is not to say, oh, no, there's an entire feminine set of values that we live up to that deserves more respect than it's gotten, that deserves not to be laughed at, that deserves not to be uh, denigrated, that that feminine feminine, uh, system of values is equal to a male system of values and needs to coexist with it in in tandem with it and in uh, uh, connection with it. If if that were feminism, I would be a feminist. If that were feminism, I'd be wearing one of those shirts with the feminine symbol on it. But feminism has become Uh, this foolish, foolish, dishonest, uh, sick even uh, philosophy telling women to be like men. So I saw this thing in the Atlantic, is the virus bad for feminism? And I thought, who cares? Who cares whether it's bad for feminism? Why aren't you asking, is it good for people? Is it good for women? Is it good for men? You know, obviously it's bad. Obviously the virus is bad. But if it hurts feminism, who cares? And it's the same thing with socialism, because I think that that is the problem. I think the problem we're facing is this problem of isms, that once you've gotten yourself tied up with a philosophy, even a philosophy that's a good philosophy, you're going to start to make mistakes if you don't keep checking back with the moral standards, if you don't keep checking back with God, essentially, with religion, uh, with religious precepts that have lasted through time, with religious precepts that have come down to us through time. If you don't stop uh, checking with that, every system is going to do you wrong. You know, there's a wonderful cartoon. I played little pieces of it from four. It just came out right after World War II, I think 1948. Uh, and it was directed by Hanna-Barbera, who you may never have heard of, but he, they made the Flintstones and the Jetsons, and they had their, their kind of period of time in the 60s and 70s. Uh, and it, it, it was called uh, Make Mine Freedom. And it was to tell people, because they were all, then too, uh, right, communism was so big and everybody thought the Soviet Union was the wave of the future. I've seen the future and it works. And there were still fascists around who thought, oh, you know, if we only get, you know, Hitler didn't do it right, but if we only get the fascism right. And, it, and so they put out this thing that was basically just in favor of freedom, make mine freedom. And it starts out with telling you about the freedoms of America and how they lead to us arguing from different points of view. They have the working man, they have the capitalist, they have the politician, and they have the farmer. And here's just a little clip. Okay, so we got our freedom, but management's lousing up everything. Labor is at fault. It's ruining the country. My constituents, as your elected representative, I can assure you labor's right. Management's right. I'm strictly neutral. Labor? Management, politicians, fully. Oh, they can't tell corn from oats. Work! It's only right. take the right. money out of right. work. Hurry, right. hurry, hurry, step right up, folks. Here's the answer to your problems, Dr. Utopia's sensational new discovery, ism. Ism will cure any ailment of the body politic. It's terrific, it's tremendous. Once you swallow the contents of this bottle, you'll have the bountiful benefit of higher wages, shorter hours, and security. Enormous profits, no strikes. Remember, you're the big boss. Government control, no worry about votes. Name your own salary. Bigger crops, lower cost. Why, ism even makes the weather perfect every day. (laughs) <laughs> and this is this is a, a like obviously the guy's a snake oil salesman selling ism and it's going to do everything for everybody. Once you get into that mindset, people stop mattering to you, and people stop coming first, and the good of of the uh, country and the good of the people and the good of the things of the things that you love and the meaning of love and the purpose of love, love and propagating love. Once those things become secondary to your ism, you're doomed. And I think that that's what's happened to the New York Times. I think it's what's happened to Nancy Pelosi. I've said this to conservatives. You've heard me. I think if you ever come on and listen to some of the uh, extra shows we do, where I've argued with people about capitalism, even capitalism, which I love, and capitalism. The, re- the reason capitalism gets a little bit more respect for me is because it's less of a system. It's not really an ism. It's just free. It's supposed to be just free markets. But if in keeping your free markets, you let people die, if you let communities collapse, if you cheat people to get an extra profit, capitalism has no way of stopping that. No ism. No ism has a way of stopping the sins of the human heart from coming forward. And so you have to turn to God. And it's tough. It's tough when you look to God, when you look to uh spiritual ideas for morality. It's tough when you got all these crazy people <laughs> saying things that just aren't true. You know, Robert Spencer, he's the guy who like is always going after the Muslims. He was reporting on this guy, Qatar bin Muhammad, who's an imam in Syracuse, who says the reason the virus is spreading is because women are walking around showing their ankles, right, which is part of their private parts, according to him. And that's what's causing the uh, virus to spread. And there's a guy, Stephen Andrew, who is a, he's a 
right-wing Christian pastor who says it's because of the gay people, you know, <laughs> that's all. And, you know, I, I actually went online today and looked at what Joel Osteen is saying, because I've always wondered, you know, what is he going to do when disaster strikes? And he gave this hugely attended uh, sermon online where he, this, here's a little clip of that. Difficult times. Keep this phrase in your spirit. Greater is coming. God didn't bring you this far to leave you. He wouldn't have allowed it if it was going to keep you from your destiny. Just the opposite, it's going to launch you into your destiny. Paul said, these light afflictions are for a moment, but they are working in us an eternal weight of glory. The trouble is temporary, the glory is permanent. The key is don't stay focused on the suffering, stay focused on the glory that's coming. It may be tough right now. Life has dealt you an unfair hand. That suffering is not in vain. It's serving a purpose. It's leading you to greater honor, greater favor, greater victories. See, now the problem with this is, and I know some people find this very encouraging, and there is a level at which I actually agree with them. There's a level at which, you know, the suffering that we have here, I do believe is going to make sense to us in eternity. But that, with Osteen, I always feel that that's not what he's saying. <laughs> what I feel what he's saying is that you're going to have better luck later. And so, that, you know, God is setting you up for a big reward in this life. That's what I'm always afraid of because the, what, the quote from the Bible, he says, is the glory is eternal. That's true. But that doesn't stop the grief of life. And that's, that is the problem for me with that philosophy. That's why I've always found that philosophy, uh, you know, a philosophy that sounds good but is inherently uh, corrupt. And by corrupt, I don't mean he's corrupt. I mean that there's a, a glitch in the philosophy itself. I, too, believe that all things work for the good to those who love God, but that's all things, right? That's forever. I believe that he has created an amazing mosaic that will work out for the best in eternity, but that doesn't stop me from feeling grief in this life. It doesn't stop me from feeling fear in this life. It doesn't stop me from not understanding what he's up to and feeling lost, like I think all of us feel it. And I think denying that, denying those feelings, I don't think that's what you're supposed to do. That's not what the Psalms tell us. The Psalms tell us to cry out to God. The the Psalms tell us to bring our grief and our fear to God. And so I think that, you know, when we're trying to understand what God is doing, because I do believe that God speaks to us, and I do believe he speaks to us in these crises, but what the only way for us to understand it is from the ground up. From the only way for us to understand it is what should we be doing as individuals, as a culture, as a nation, what should we be doing? to serve God in this moment of of fear and crisis. And when you start from that point of view, you start to get some answers. You know, there's a a priest in uh, San Giovanni Battista in Italy, an Italian priest uh, who died in the early hours in the hospital of Laveri Laveri Bergamo. He's age 72. He'd been hospitalized for several days with a coronavirus infection, but he gave his ventilator to a younger man and he died. There's a guy who maybe understands what God is up to in this current moment. And so look to yourself in order to understand God. Look to your culture in order to understand God. Look to what the nation should be doing. Let me end with a final reflection that I just got from Hollywood in Toto, which is not completely separate from what I was just saying. Marvel, the Marvel comics, have an (laughs) updated New Warriors title, which has new uh, heroes in it. Uh, One of them is called Snowflake, (laughs) <laughs> a cryokinetic who can materialize snowflake-shaped shuriken projectiles. I guess look, there's stars for throwing. Uh, safe sp- and then there's Safe Space, who can materialize pink force fields, but he can't inhabit them himself. The reflex only works if he's protecting others. Snowflake and Safe Space are woke superheroes. You know, I, we live in a therapeutic community instead of an honor community. We live in a place where we don't keep, keep a stiff upper lip, but we believe that talking about our problems, talking about our emotions are the ways to handle those emotions. That's a half truth. It is half true that we should express ourselves. It is half true that we should cert- we should certainly bring our troubles to God. We should certainly bring them to therapists. We should certainly talk to friends. If you are in difficulty, if you suffer trauma, talking about things is a way to heal yourself. There's no question about it. But the point of healing yourself, the point of healing yourself is to learn faith and to learn calm and to learn courage and to learn joy. The point of the emotions is not the emotions. 
The point of expressing your emotions is making sure that you are the best person you can be in order to handle these crises. And that's the problem with the left. They have taken the therapy and put it as the actual goal. The goal of therapy is mental health. Listen, you know, this thing, as I say, I truly, truly believe that this thing is going to pass uh, faster than we fear. But I don't know when and I don't know how and I don't know what exactly is going to happen next because nobody does. Nobody knows. But I do know that wh- the way you behave now is going to have a big effect on your future and the way you think about yourself and the way your family thinks about you. And I think that those are the things that we should think about not preserving, not preserving some ism, some philosophy that we want to be right, even if it's conservatism. Those are not the things that we have to care about. We ha- what we have to care about is the people and how we can love them and what the best thing for them, the people in our lives and the people in our country and the people in our world, what the best thing for them is at every given moment. That's what I think a lot of our leaders are trying to do, but some of them not so much. And I just want to say to them, we see you. I'll be back tomorrow with the mailbag. All your problems will be solved. <laughs> Maybe I'll answer your questions correctly. We'll see. I'm Andrew Claven. This is The Andrew Claven Show. The Andrew Claven Show is produced by Robert Sterling and directed by Mike Joyner. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Technical producer, Austin Stevens. And our supervising producer is Mathis Glover. Assistant director, Pavel Wydowski. Edited by Adam Saievitz. Audio mixed by Robin Fenderson. Hair and makeup is by Jesua Alvera. Animations are by Cynthia Angulo. Production assistants, McKenna Waters and Ryan Love. The Andrew Claven Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2020. House and Senate Democrats torpedo a bipartisan coronavirus relief bill, raising an important question. If elected Democrats aren't taking the pandemic seriously, why should we? We will examine the political shenanigans and the light at the end of the economic tunnel. Then the mainstream media spread a story of a man dying from the drug touted by President Trump as a possible cure for coronavirus. The only problem with their story is it's completely false. We'll take a look at what really happened. Check it out on The Michael Knowles Show.